Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Um, it's episode two, Conversations on Decentralized Clinical Trials, Data Privacy. Um, as I said, this is episode two. Our first episode was held on July 13th. And let me just advance the slide here. It's This webinar is on humanizing clinical research data. And it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator and our panelists, Jane Miles, VP Clinical Trial Innovation with CureBase, Sean Lynch, VP Clinical Operations with CureBase, and Phyllis Kaplan, Clinical Trial Participant. So at this point, I will have Jane start facilitating the conversation. Thank you. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us for this short and sweet flash webinar today. And we want to talk to you today about data and trials and how they fit together, because at the end of the day, the whole purpose of a clinical trial is to create data for making decisions. Um, so I'm really delighted to be joined by my colleague, Sean, and by my new medical hero, Phyllis. And I will actually ask them to do a really quick intro about why you're here and why it's exciting. Thanks, Jane. I can go first. Sean Lynch, VP CleanOps at CureBase. I started my career as a data manager and have also worked at EDC companies and built my own in the past. So the entire infrastructure of clinical data management is near and dear to my heart because at the end of the day, it requires clinical data to answer that scientific hypothesis. And that data comes from patients. And so we need to treat it very carefully along the way too. Phyllis? Yeah, I'm Phyllis Kaplan. I am a five times type one diabetes clinical trial participant and really happy to provide those patient insights around uh, data and clinical trials and all that other good stuff. Great, thank you both. Now, Joan, could you please advance to the next slide? Um, I wanted to just let you know who CureBase is. We don't need to go look at the slide, but CureBase is a company that was founded on the principle of really enabling patients to participate in trials from anywhere. So we think about that as modernizing clinical trials, making them more aligned to the way that both patients and physicians want to contribute to clinical research and making it easier for everyone so that more people will participate and we get those scientific answers more quickly. And now I'm going to turn it over to my dear friend, Sean, to explain high level what happens in that whole data collection process. And then we're gonna start asking some questions of Phyllis and her experience in those five trials. Great. Thanks, Jane. All right, who's ready for a crash course in clinical data management in two minutes? Here we go, next slide. Um, so there we go, data. Where does data come from? At the end of the day, all clinical trial data comes from the patient, but it comes from a couple of different sources along the way. You know, Traditionally, it was collected by a um, you know, interview from a, a CRC or a PI directly to the patient and then entered onto paper and then entered into an electronic database. But these days, the types of data can come from a number of different sources. They can come from wearables, it can come from third-party data sets like, like laboratories, but ultimately that data is still coming from the patient. So at the end of the day, all of these different sources of data are gonna be collated and collected at the site and entered into the, the sponsor, the pharmaceutical company's single database. These are often called EDCs, electronic data capture systems. And then there's a ton of like transformation and organization of that data that happens along the way. There's also anonymization that happens along the way. So the site is gonna know you as Phyllis, but you know, as it gets entered into the database, it's gonna be coded into an anonymized number. That's a really important part. The people who work in trial are not allowed to see your PHI or PII. Even further downstream, there's a ton more transformations that happen to organize that data into discrete data sets that can then be used for statistical analysis. And it's those data sets that are used to answer the, the scientific questions to determine if the endpoints for safety and efficacy have been met along the way. 
And that's ultimately the key outcome of every clinical trial is that set of data, which you must then deliver to the regulator like the FDA as part of your ultimate submission to it. And they will look at your data. They'll pour over it too. They'll do their own analysis to verify that the sponsor did it the correct way as well. And that's, that's where the data ends in a single clinical trial, but it's not where the data really ends. And I kind of want to talk to, to Phyllis and ask a few questions around, you know, her experience of what happened to her data in, in a clinical trial. So, so Phyllis, I guess the first question I'll ask, and Jane, please jump in as we go along. But, you know, at the very start of the trial, when you first became aware and wanted to consent into a clinical trial, what questions did you ask around privacy and the types of data that would be collected and what would happen to it? Um, admittedly, I didn't ask a lot, um, primarily because I felt like I didn't really have a choice in the matter of I'm agreeing to participate in this clinical trial. And if I have any questions about, it's basically I can participate as it's laid out or not. So, you know, from that point of view, I thought, well, those are my options. I, you know, I consent to that part and, you know, we'll take it from there. I, I guess lack of choice is no choice at all. Was right. it at least made clear to you what happened to your data after it was collected from you? Um, it might have been, you know, in that 25 page or 20 page document, but I feel like there's a missing communication. You know, once the trial is done, just that closing the loop of not just thank you for participating, but, you know, we've destroyed your data. So I feel like that piece would help me and hopefully a lot of other people have that sense of, all right, these people are doing the right thing. Ahead, we Jane. have an audience question. So I'm interjecting because I think it fits here pretty well. Um, the question from the attendee is, what would you consider the top challenge in collecting patient data and what approaches are being used to address this challenge? Mm. I might, I might take the first stab at that one. <laughs> I think that the greatest challenge in collecting patient data is, um, you know, there's a terminology that we use in our, in our industry called ALCOA, making sure the data is attributable, leg legible, et cetera. But really, it's about making sure the data is collected in a timely fashion. From the point that a piece of data was created, let's say, for example, you took your, your blood pressure on your watch. From the point that the data was created to when it was collected, the greater the distance in time, the lower the quality of the data. So I think that's the real challenge. Like even with lots of wearable devices, so much of clinical trial data like, like ePros, it relies upon memory and recollection of what's happened. Did I actually have an AE? What medication did I take? What was that dose? And so if we can close the gap and make data collection more real time, in the way that your, your Apple Watch or other wearables collect things or fill us your, your diabetes glucose monitors, collect data in real time, that would be a major win. It's a really great audience question. Um, Phyllis, just, just to tag back onto what you, what you last said, have you ever in, in all five year trials ever received any, any trial outcomes or information around what happened to your data? I have not. Um, including medical, my own personal medical reports. Um, you know, at the time I was like, you know, this is great, this is great, but it's putting the burden back on the clinical trial participant to follow up and say, where's my, where's my personal information? Where's my lab results? And, you know, that, that's a big burden. It is a big burden, and, I, <laughs> and I, I don't think it's fair to put that on the patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, the patient's already giving of themselves to participate in the trial. I think sponsors need to step up and figure out better ways to get appropriate amounts of data back to that patient so they understand that their contribution actually really added value. Right. Jane, I know that's that that that's a signal, right? Dear to your heart, it is. Um, I have a follow-on question. So you never got your own data, like your own clinical results back. Did you find out if the trials were successful or not? Nope, nothing. Wow. So it was a bit of a data black hole. 
Yeah, I mean, because these were kind of, um, I don't want to, newsworthy is not quite the right <laughs> term, but these were kind of big, some of these trials that I participated in diabetes uh, technology devices. So I kind of figured out, you know, by five years, it's not come to market. I haven't seen any update. I can assume what happened, but it also could be that they need another five, six, seven, eight years to collect more data. So short answer is no. <laughs> Phyllis, was ever um, explained to you two things? What, who sees your data within the clinical trial and then what happens to it post-clinical trial? No to both of those. Would it be helpful if I shared some of my experience around, around both those answers? That would be great. So with regards to who sees your data, it's actually quite a lot of people. It is all anonymized. Um, you know, that, that is worth pointing out. But it's everyone from data managers and safety managers, project managers, biostatisticians and programmers. And of course, then that all gets aggregated and rolled up and executives start seeing it because that's the ultimately the results of, of uh, the drug that their company is studying. So it is visible to a lot of people, but not attributable to you as an individual. Um, then what happens to your data after that one trial? Well, it is still used. And you know, I think that's not made very clear to participants that your data is actually gonna be continuously used by that sponsor company. It mostly for the sake of in better informing the design of future trials, um, but also, you know, it, might just be one trial of many that supports an ultimate, ultimately a submission to a regulator. So the data lives on. Um, and I don't think that's made very clear in consenting processes these days. How do you feel about your data continuing to have a life after the one trial? I'm like, I, I think I mentioned before that I'm okay with it. I, I want to help, you know, if my data can help shed some new light on a new treatment or advance further clinical trials, I'm all for it. I just want to be made aware of, of that. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to chime in too, because there's the data, say, like with your um, glucose values. But in some trials, we collect biospecimens like pathology and tissue samples, which might be banked and used for a very long time after the trial is over. And they're actually really important for lots of different reasons. But as a participant, you have the right to say whether or not you're willing for that specimen to be used in the analysis in the future setting after the trial is over. So that's just a make sure that you ask all the questions suggestion. Yeah, it's hard to know what to ask if you're not aware of that, right? <laughs> that That's the problem. I think that's a fantastic observation. Like patients may, it's already difficult enough for patients to know about clinical research and to also inform them about the vast realm of data privacy and, and how that works. Like that's another big barrier for us all to overcome. And, you know, perhaps there's an opportunity there for us to create cheat sheets and educational material to help help patients understand all of this. And I think conversations like this are a really good step towards that. So we have about one minute left. I think it's a good time for a couple of key takeaways. Um, first is not enough patients learn what happens about the trials they participate in or their own results from being in a trial. The second, and Sean, you did a brilliant job describing this, your data is visible, but not attributable to you as an individual. So it's anonymized and used in a scientific way. You will not expect to get a phone call from the research sponsor saying, by the way, we noticed X. <laughs> um, and third, there's a real opportunity to educate people about data, how it's used, and how to really ask the questions when they're considering being in a trial so you know what you're agreeing to. I think that's it, Joan. I need to hand it back to you quickly. Well, thank you very much. Um, 
Let me just get my camera on here for a minute. That was a very enlightening conversation, discussion, uh, Sean, Phyllis, and Jane. And uh, just mark your calendars for episode number three on November 2nd, um, continuation of conversations on clinical trials. And again, thank you for everyone for attending this 15 minute um, rapid, quick conversation with Jane, Sean, and Phyllis. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.